today's webinar is the topic is DNA automation with nanostructured ceramics. This is uh, going to be conducted by Dr. Mario Blanco. Um, Mario Blanco is the CEO of a company uh, in Tucson, Arizona called Nanopec. So today's webinar is brought to you by NAC, the NAC Center. So the NAC Center is the Nanotechnology Application and Career Knowledge Resource Center, which is an NSF ATE regional center for uh, nanofabrication education. Uh, NAC is a subsidiary of the CNEU, which is the Center for Nanotechnology Education and Utilization of Penn State University. So just a couple of quick logistical things before we turn it over to Mario for the uh, webinar itself. So this will be recorded. So if you were unable to make the webinar or if you were at the webinar and wanted to share it with somebody else after the fact, this will be posted um, on our channel here, the YouTube channel. So on the Zoom controls, you have a Q&A module and that's what you're going to use for technical questions on his topic. So questions on his actual science. And then the other kind of questions that we get during webinars are control issues with Zoom. So please use the chat window uh, if you have questions on that. And with that, I'm going to introduce uh, myself again. I'm Zach Gray. I'm the managing director for Penn State's Center for Nanotechnology Education Utilization. Uh, Vishal Saravade is our co-host and our presenter today, again, is Dr. Mario Blanco. Um, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Mario um, to begin the webinar. Thank you so much, Zach. I'd like to, but first of all, thank you for this invitation, the Next Center, Vishal, and Rene. Uh, it is a privilege uh, for me to be directing uh, the attention of uh, our research uh, and our directions uh, uh, in this webinar. And, uh, Penn State is very familiar to me. I lived in Pennsylvania for six years. Uh, that's where my two children were born, actually. Uh, if anyone knows where Abington is, Abington Hospital, I lived uh, near Valley Forge uh, when I used to work for a company that is now being, has been acquired called Roman Haas, very important company at the time. Uh, so I enjoyed those six years, except the very cold winters. I was used to California. So this is where I am now in Tucson, warmer weather. So um, I'm a graduate of UCLA and I work at the California Institute of Technology for 16 years. Um, I do have 65 plus publications, referee publications and uh, over 15 uh, granted patents. And with my current company, I'm the CEO. Second time I am a CEO and the fourth uh, startup I'm involved in. So I'm very excited to tell you about uh, our efforts uh, to achieve a uh, the next level of DNA synthesis automation using our patented nanostructure ceramics. And I look forward to your questions. Uh, before I get into that, I think it's important to understand why DNA synthesis uh, automation is important. So our main goals um, include this to synthesize genes that are difficult to clone, often um, bacteria uh, or mammalian cells, have difficulty uh, doing certain constructions such as palindromic sequences, uh, simply because they have additional code in, in, in their genetics to, to prevent some dangerous constructs, which, which will be useful or are useful in a pharmaceutical therapeutic setting. But also we are very familiar with uh, mRNA vaccines and therapeutic candidates uh, for, for cancer, for example. Um, and what we offer are to be able to make this without any animal products, without uh, uh, bovine serum albumin uh, or any bacterial E. coli fermentation, which is important because that may lead to contamination in the product. And even a small amount of uh, bacterial protein may elicit an immune reaction during clinical trials. And although you may have uh, an amazing new therapeutic, uh, the FDA might not approve it because the 1%, 2%, X percent of your uh, population uh, had a, an immune reaction to, to the residual protein, bacterial protein. So, and it's very expensive um, and limits the number of tests that, that you successfully can, can do if you're all the time worrying about this type of contamination. Um, also, to provide large-scale gene synthesis, uh, it's, it's important for two areas, uh, 
Uh, one is DNA banking. Uh, it so happens that Nanopec provides uh, materials, uh, chips for the largest DNA bank in the world. Um, and uh, we're also looking at archiving. Uh, you may have or may not have heard, but uh, uh, DNA uh, is a long lasting medium to store information. We know that because uh, DNA from Neanderthal 40,000 years ago uh, has been uh, uh, decoded. I think this year's uh, uh, Nobel Prize went to uh, the scientists uh, for medicine and physiology responsible uh, for decoding the Neanderthal uh, genome. So uh, DNA uh, lasts a lot longer than your DVDs and CDs and even your flash drives. Um, it's estimated in the tens of thousands of years. If you keep it under, uh, let's say, encapsulated inside a steel um, bullet or, or capsule and filled with argon, uh, it probably supersedes 40,000 uh, years. So, um, so companies uh, like banks and, of course, cloud, uh, iCloud companies that want to archive data um, they are looking at DNA as, uh, as, as, as the means to do that. Um, also, we want to optimize uh, uh, colon use uh, to boost targeted protein expression, uh, meaning uh, you want the uh, uh, messenger RNA to be as fast as possible to go through the ribosome uh, to express more protein faster. And so because there is redundancies, you, you may want to try uh, multiple variants of your DNA, which gets translated into messenger RNA for, for uh, translation. Um, another area of interest is uh, CRISPR. Of course, you, you, you have heard, and you probably know very well of the already few successes uh, with CRISPR-Cas9 edited genes. There's been uh, uh, some recent uh, successes in terms of full remission or cure of certain uh, 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 conditions. So, uh, of course, um, that is a, a very sophisticated uh, biological tool, um, but uh, sooner or later, you need to uh, include the gene that you want to add uh, using this technology, and that means you need to create that gene de novo. So um, I want from the onset to say that there is a difference between um, um, uh, using the biological means to replicate DNA. That's not what we are talking about. We are talking about creating uh, whole new sequences, if you will, uh, single-stranded DNA, if that helps, uh, uh, if that helps you uh, understand what we're doing uh, from scratch. So you just type a sequence in a computer and then the synthesizer, the materials, the chemistry uh, does, does the rest. So, so we will uh, hopefully be uh, of use to CRISPR-Cas9, CRISPR companies that are doing uh, gene editing. And uh, of course, uh, recombinant antibodies are uh, very important. So how can we um, humanize them to, to create them in, 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 in good amounts in, in, let's say, mammalian cells, which may or may not be human cells? So this is just a, a, a number of areas that DNA synthesis automation can really improve. And uh, what you're talking about is not a factor of two, it's not a factor of 10. Uh, we're, we're looking at factors of 100 uh, in terms of speed and, and efficiency and, and accuracy uh, 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 or above. So that, that's, that's the goal. Uh, in short, we want to realize the full potential of synthetic biology, uh, which we uh, we always say is to protect, meaning vaccines, to heal, means therapeutics, but also to improve the quality of our lives. Uh, some of us say longevity or uh, extend life, but life needs to be extended with, with good quality. We don't want to live for a very long time uh, with, with, with bad health, right? So I'll talk to you about uh, uh, the fundamentals, uh, the applications, um, I will make a stop for questions uh, from you, please. Uh, in the middle of the presentation, I'd like to hear some of your questions. We have plenty of time. I speak fast. I hope you 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 understand my accent, um, and then we can move forward uh, to the last part of the presentation uh, on a little bit of how this works and what is the next level of automation that um, we we have accomplished, and we are also. Uh, continuing our efforts to increase. 
But before getting into um, the, the subject matter, I'd like to review uh, for some of you who may not be physical uh, scientists, uh, uh, like chemists or, or physicists um, or material scientists or, or engineers. What, what is a nanometer? So a nanometer is 10 to the minus nine meters. So that's uh, 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 zero point followed by eight zeros and a one. That's the size of one nanometer. But for us, this number, this dimension is not within our daily experience. So I, I'd like to, to, to show the following. I uh, apologize, this is for high schoolers, but it's been very effective in teaching what a nanometer is. Uh, and we will mention this number quite a bit. So uh, this is a scanning electron micrograph of a human hair. Uh, the, the width is what I want you to uh, pay attention to. Uh, not the length, and that's 80, about 80,000 to 100,000, you know, varies from individual to individual, but that's 80,000 nanometers in width. And um, uh, this picture here at the bottom is, of course, is the eye of a needle. But uh, if you squint or look very carefully, uh, there is a small tiny figure at the bottom uh, of the eye of this needle. That is a sculpture. Uh, that sculpture was done at the University of Vienna and uh, it was done using uh, laser interferometry and uh, curable uh, resins. And of course, I'm gonna show it to you. But what I'd like to do is show that sculpture uh, as if it was positioned on the surface of that hair. Um, so roughly that sculpture is about 10,000 nanometers in height. And I'm gonna continue this exercise and then show you just the, uh, just the arm. Uh, so the arm is 2,000 nanometers in, in length. And now just the hand is about 500 nanometers. And now I'm going to expand um, uh, only the thumb. And uh, once, uh, once we're here, that's where I want you to be. Because uh, that circle over there, uh, 50 nanometers, uh, that is a typical size of the nanostructures on our ceramics that we are able to fabricate. And uh, uh, so this begins to give you an idea for how small uh, the structures, the pores uh, on our ceramic uh, films um, are. Uh, don't worry, I'll stop for questions a little bit in a little bit. But um, why is this small important? Well, uh, small means fast. I mean, if you look at the rate of movement for, for insects, then bacteria, you're talking about, you know, uh, not seconds, you're talking about milliseconds. Uh, and the smaller the, any feature, the higher the frequencies, the faster the movement. So the idea then that we had was, can we um, apply the same concepts uh, that made electronic chips uh, fast uh, into the gigahertz? Uh, potentially we will reach the levels of that, but uh, but, but the idea is then reduce the size of your working elements so you can attain uh, high frequencies. And uh, so let me go back to 1947 um, when the transistor was invented. This is the first transistor. Uh, it, it does have the three electrodes as any ordinary transistor. And it was a big crystal. Uh, the size of this is one inch. So keep, keep that in mind uh, because for the current uh, workhorse of DNA synthesis, we are talking about uh, about one inch as well. But um, one transistor means we, we, we can store one bit of information, uh, a zero or a one. But in 2020, Apple came up with the A14 chip, which is uh, a quarter of an inch uh, in length. And you have 11.8 billion transistors and the speed is also amazing. You can actually uh, upload uh, or, or, or store four full uh, human genomes per second. Uh, that's how fast that chip runs. So small uh, reduction in size equates with uh, higher speeds. Um, this is the current workhorse for DNA uh, synthesis. Uh, these are either uh, wells in a microplate, or as it's shown here, a column, a plastic column, and it's filled inside with what is called a frit. This frit is made of compressed um, uh, glass beads, uh, and they named this uh, control pore glass, invented in 1934. And the 
largest number of oligos you can make is using the uh, the most uh, refined or the the the, the high density uh, microplates with 726 oligos, and you can see the growth of this has been linear, and it's taken a couple of decades to get from uh, from 24 to 726 oligos. But the good thing about it is that in a single column you get one micro mole uh, of 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 DNA. So. Uh, just to remind you, an oligo is a piece of DNA. Uh, it, it may be typically single-stranded, and roughly today, uh, the standard is 60 nucleotides, 60 bases, uh, but there are companies that do 100, some that dare to do 300. Uh, this is our one of our products. Uh, it's a chip, uh, 1 16th of an inch, so it's much smaller than the Apple chip. And in the center, there is a optical code. Uh, this is like a QR code. Think of it as a QR code. It's actually data matrix code, but it's very similar. And our, customer, our customers use this to, to direct that chip through a chemical flow, uh, uh, flow chart. Uh, so they know when to add A, C, T, or G to that particular chip. So one oligo per chip. And we've been making and selling this since 2021. Uh, but we started the work in 2019 at the end of 2019, uh, pre-pandemic. Uh, uh, so uh, it, it came out really handy uh, when there was a need to speed up uh, DNA synthesis. Uh, in that single chip, uh, you can make also a single oligo. And then um, one of our customers uh, can do overnight um, um, uh, 32,000 chips. So basically, <clears throat> Uh, that allows you to do multiple variants of a large gene overnight. Uh, we are now moving to a plate, which is 10 by 10 centimeters. Uh, that's for our internal uh, uh, synthesizer. Uh, this is what our customers use, but we are going to a different format. We want very large chips where we can do um, 180,000 oligos uh, maximum. And the nice thing is that the scale uh, of, of this chip will allow us to do 1.8 micromoles, which is very similar to what can be accomplished with standard uh, uh, low, low, low automation uh, methods such as control port glass. How do we do the chemistry? Well, it's, it's pure chemistry, right? So there is no enzymes involved, there is no bacteria, there is no fermentation involved. So there is a, this cycle is, 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 is uh, accredited to characters. Characters uh, uh, came up with this in the 1960s, I believe, and it's a multi-step process. Um, uh, each cycle basically adds one base uh, to, to, to the growing oligo. And it tries to avoid errors uh, by doing certain operations such as capping, for example, uh, where you stop any, any uh, DNA chain that has not added the current base. So if you do this carefully, you can achieve uh, high quality uh, DNA, single stranded in also in good yields. So up to now, we have applied a very simplified workflow. Um, we uh, are being, we have been providing a platform for our customers, which uh, means we provide the ceramic film or chips uh, in addition, we have proprietary technology to get the first base uh, placed on the chip uh, in, a, in a way in which they are spaced out, but not too far away from each other. Think of it as growing a forest. Um, if you put the seedlings far apart from each other, each tree will grow very well because there won't be shade from other trees around it. But your overall yield will be low. If you go the other way, if you put the seedlings too close to each other, your yield will also suffer because you will have lots of trees, but they will not uh, grow as well. So there is a, a Goldilocks medium, I guess uh, we can call it. And we have the technology, uh, proprietary technology to do that and also to verify uh, that yes, the distance is the appropriate distance. So. So this is what we've been doing, but now uh, uh, when we send this to our customers, then they use their own synthesizer to grow the gene of interest to them. Uh, 
but many of our customers don't have that expertise. That's the reason why we're moving that all the way to the right, where uh, we don't do the DNA, but we will provide a turnkey solution to our customers, uh, both the commercial academic, so that they can do this themselves uh, without disclosing their precious uh, sequences to us. Uh, typically, most companies use uh, outsourcing, meaning they go uh, to a, a company outside. Uh, examples in the US include IPT, GenScript, Twist. Outside the United States is much cheaper, so you, you, you can go to, for example, Wuxi, which probably makes more um, DNA than any other company for pharmaceutical therapeutic use than any other company in the world. Um, so um, if you don't send those sequences outside the company, then no one knows exactly how you are doing what you're doing. Uh, even though you may have nicely signed documents, um, you, know, you don't wanna risk uh, those sequences to be uh, at least in the R&D and the preclinical tests to be known by, by others. Now, um, what is the core of our technology? Uh, I, I call this DNA paper. Uh, it's not paper, but I believe that um, um, attempts to print uh, DNA as opposed to micropipe um, with high densities and frequencies have been done. Uh, there are patterns going back to 2004 where you will find DNA printers using, uh, at the time, the highest resolution available, um, below 300 PPIs, uh, dots per inch. Um, but since then, you know, even a, uh, a house printer, you know, can do very high resolution, 1200 DPI and, and above. Uh, so it, it's been tried uh, and it, 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 it was tried on paper, it was tried on glass, and there are issues with those materials. Um, um, uh, in, on paper, you have that, you can have bleaching of uh, reagents from one uh, well to another, from one piece to another, and that means contamination. On glass, you can avoid that by only activating pieces of, of the glass surface, the small regions, but it's very hard to activate glass. And uh, given that you only have the flat surface to work with, your yields are going to be on the order of picomolar uh, per, per square centimeter. Um, so uh, there is a commercial printer you can actually uh, buy, uh, and, but it's always sold for academic purposes. Uh, it doesn't have the power to generate sufficient amounts of DNA or RNA. By the way, uh, the chemistry can be directly applied to produce RNA, not just DNA. Um, so it is a research tool. It's not something that can just, uh, academic research, not, not something that can be put into a commercial environment. Maybe you can, but you need to do PCR. You need to do amplification after that. So what we have is this ceramic. Uh, it's not a structure, meaning it has pores and they are not random. They are truly controlled pore size. We can truly call this controlled pore size uh, pores. Uh, we control the diameter of the pore as well as the length of the pore. Um, and uh, uh, as I mentioned, we also have the ability to control the surface chemistry, the surface spacing. Uh, and we have patented this, plat this platform, we call it DNA Reacts, DNA Reacts. So this is a scanning electro micrograph, I admit. This is one of the best materials that we produce because we can produce them order like a honeycomb system here, um, where uh, by changing the conditions, typically working at low temperatures, meaning uh, low, uh, low speeds of fabrication, we can create highly ordered uh, nanostructure ceramic films, but it doesn't really confer you much of uh, an advantage over a disorder or quasi order uh, 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 ceramic film. As long as the pores are all vertical and there's no crossovers, no contamination, uh, we can use a slight disorder ceramic films and uh, they are faster to produce. So. So we don't typically um, aim at getting order uh, like this on, uh, to create the lattices, uh, such as honeycombs. Hexagonal close pack is the, the, the official name of this. Uh, but some disorder um, um, you know, uh, is, is, is admittedly uh, employed so that we produce this material much faster. So 
This is market ready technology. It's been customer tested already with high performance. They report uh, data to us. It's not our own analysis, it's their own data. Uh, and we work really hard to lower the cost uh, uh, and do a scalable in-house production of this ceramic film. And we patented this DNA automation platform. One of the interesting parts of lowering the cost was um, actually, um, I would say, uh, incidental to the desire to lower the cost. And that is that um, academics uh, and other uh, companies use toxic chemicals to produce similar materials. Uh, they include mm, mm, mercurous chloride, as well as hexavalent chromium. And I decided I wasn't gonna use those chemicals around my lab and expose my, my staff to this. So we found ways of doing this process without using um, mercurous chloride or hexavalent chromium. And that translated into savings because we don't have to pay hazmat transport, uh, um, uh, protective uh, equipment, PPE, and also uh, uh, hazmat uh, uh, waste uh, disposal uh, of contaminated solutions. So that desire to protect our staff uh, translated into significant savings uh, we estimate about 75% uh, savings in cost. Uh, I want to just briefly um, indicate that most of the reaction, 99% of the reaction occurs inside the pores. And I'm showing here an schematic view of the pore and, uh, uh, and that square uh, top right C square. And then I kind of blow up the inside of the pore and you know, I kind of show an RNA in this case, uh, an RNA uh, chain growing inside from, from the walls. So this is solid state synthesis. The material is held covalently bound to the interior of the pore while it's being grown one nucleotide at a time. And once you're done, once you're done with this, then you cleave it from the surface. On the top left, you see the actual structure of control pore glass. Uh, so I don't know why it's called control pore because it looks to me like uh, coral, like, uh, but it's beautiful though. Uh, however, the pore size distribution is very broad, uh, not uniform. And um, that leads to a problem where, problem where if you focus on small pores and we specialize on sizes between 50 to 400 uh, nanometers in diameter, the smaller the pore, the more DNA, the more RNA you're gonna grow, but um, there is limits to how big uh, that oligo uh, can grow because eventually it's too big to fit inside the pore. So this material, control pore glass on the bottom left corner, uh, has pores with very small diameters. And uh, that leads to something technically called short mirrors, which means the oligos are not the right size and you need to cap them so they don't waste more of your reagent and that means lower yields. So the strategy uh, to overcome that is to go to very large pores, uh, typically a thousand angstroms uh, and above, um, uh, much larger than that. And that means uh, lower, lower, lower yields, because again, it's like, you know, growing a forest. Okay, so I'm gonna stop here and uh, Zach, you take control back um, uh, to... Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so questions here. Um, so if anybody has questions, I'll take a look here. Uh, but yeah, go ahead and put your questions in the Q and A. Um, you know, so we have one here. Can you please elaborate on the quality assessment protocols of the DNA or poor nanostructures that are prepared? And Mario, you're muted right now. Great, thank you. Yes, yes, uh, very good question. As I mentioned earlier, uh, our customers are the ones that are providing that information to us, but we have already uh, reached out to commercial and academic labs uh, so that uh, we also will get our own internal validation. So typically um, just to confirm the size of the oligo, you can do um, uh, LCMS, uh, 
uh, but you actually need to do the sequencing. And our aim is to provide uh, the yields of the desired uh, sequence and then the amount of uh, single, double, triple uh, base uh, nucleotide mismatches. Because one of the things that we are pioneering um, is uh, uh, we don't want to use any uh, uh, polymerase. And that means when we synthesize, given our ability to automate the, the process at very high speeds, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment, um, there is no need to do partial um, matching of oligos uh, uh, from the three prime to the five prime uh, double helix. Uh, we can actually fill both sides. So at the end, we are left with uh, all, all bases in place. And then the ligation is the only, the only step that requires uh, an enzyme to be able to, to, to covalently link uh, those, those oligonucleotides. But we decided not to use polymerase because there's some errors in including the right base. Uh, there is mismatches. Of course, nature produces amazing enzymes that have been uh, evolved in the lab, uh, you know, that, that can do that uh, more accurately than ever. So I'm not saying that uh, those have high, high error rates. I'm saying that we don't take the risk and we, we generate the full uh, double, double stranded, uh, uh, full, full complementary. Uh, so, uh, um, so we are going in, in that direction to do full sequencing. Uh, it's cheaper, actually, I found that out, a lot cheaper to send uh, a ligated 3,000 base per gene for sequencing than it is to, to send the corresponding 100 oligos. Um, so uh, we will get the information that our customers want because most of them, not all, are interested in genes, uh, not interested in, in individual oligos. Uh, some companies do, like companies that do probes for imaging uh, or vaccines or microarrays. Yes, they want uh, oligos. And I think there is a drive to go to larger, longer oligos uh, for those purposes. But we are very narrowly, narrowly focused on the ability to do synthetic biology. Later on, we will pay more attention to uh, genomic diagnostics. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, excellent. Thanks, Mario. And, and there was another question about the geometry of your nanostructures. So would you be willing to talk a little bit about how the ratio of the pore depth to width impacts the rinsing during synthesis? Um, it seems like that might be difficult um, in the format you're using, but it sounds like you might have a solution for it. Yes, yes, uh, excellent question. Uh, uh, you're not the only one who asked that question. We've had conversations with very well-known scientists around the world. And that's one of the first questions that comes out. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping to be able to make an announcement within a couple of months at the most on a major um, uh, company led by a very well-known scientist. And that was one of the questions. And um, what better manner to answer that question than sending a video. So the question was, um, uh, as a scientist, he said, I know these are capillary uh, and capillaries have very strong uh, forces. So if you don't uh, put vacuum uh, or if you don't blow, uh, let's say noble gas like argon, you're gonna have a hard time making your reagents go through these pores. Well, I, I knew already from my customers, uh, uh, data that that was not the case, but uh, I wanted to understand that, uh, we wanted to understand that better in our lab. So, uh, but a couple of years ago, we, we started a very simple experiment, which is we take our material, our ceramic film, uh, typically we like to do 75 to 100 microns in thickness. So if you look at 100 micron pore, uh, we are looking at shape uh, form, uh, uh, factors of 1, 000, 1 to 1,000. So the pores are 1,000 times longer than they are in, di in diameter. So we began testing with water. We found the, the nanostructure uh, ceramic. By the way, nanopec means uh, uh, nanostructure uh, performance enhanced ceramics. That's what the name means. 
So we, 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 we modify the surface to make it either more hydrophilic, more hydrophobic. We have control over that chemistry. And so we found the, this, this material to be an isotropic. And we understand now why, I can't tell you, but um, it, if water on a 100 micron film uh, takes about 15 to 30 seconds to transverse without at atmospheric conditions uh, uh, from one side uh, of, the, of the ceramic film to the other. Um, uh, but if you flip it, it takes one to three minutes. So uh, it's an isotropic. And I think we now understand why. Uh, however, water is not the medium utilized to do this synthesis. The solvent use actually has to be very dry, no, no water. So the solvent used for this is actually uh, no, no, no water. And using that solvent, uh, it takes five seconds. Uh, because it's very low uh, surface tension. So in five seconds, uh, the reagents go through the entire film. Excellent. Thanks, Mario, for answering those. Um, so sure. those are the current questions we had. So I don't know if you want to go ahead and continue on with the, the remainder of your talk. Sure. No, very, very good question. So thank you so much. Um, all right. So let's move on. All right, so one of the, I mentioned one of the world's largest gene banks, actually it is the largest, uh, um, is using DNA reacts. Uh, their synthesizers, you see here a picture of their lab. Um, each one handles 8,000 chips uh, divided in, 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 in four, that's 2,000 chips. Um, and then the chips have this uh, code on the surface that I mentioned that we, we create so that mm, there is a sorter inside and then they patented this technology and they, they send each chip to the correct uh, next uh, react, reaction uh, bath. And that's how they can make 200 gene variants overnight. And when I talk about genes, uh, we use as the standard, the spike protein gene. Uh, so 3000 uh, base pairs. Uh, so they are able to make 200 variants of this gene overnight uh, with, with one of their synthesizers. Unfortunately, no one in the United States has this uh, mindset. Um, I'll explain our own mindset in the US is different because what they're able to do with this technology now that um, we, pro we replace their silicon chips, they were using silicon chips with our chips initially and they called me up after the first test and they said, oh, Mario, we're getting already 75 times more yield. And I looked, I, I replied, only 75, I expected more. <laughs> and they laugh on the other side because of course uh, they don't have 75 synthesizers. So uh, just, just moving one of their synthesizers to our material, they should be able to produce more DNA than in the rest of their entire uh, synthesizer floor. Uh, but, over the last couple of years, we've continued the effort to improve the yield, and now the yields are 460 times. By the way, we made it possible to make no changes in the synthesizer. So we took it upon ourselves to make a chip that fits inside the synthesizer, and it has all the necessary technology to, to carry the process as they were used to doing it. Um, good. So here I have a comparison in performance comparison between CPG, control port glass, which is the traditional method, most widely used in the United States. Uh, second one is silicon, which is used by companies like uh, um, Genscript and, um, and, and Twist. Twist, I think exclusively, I may not be right about this, but they exclusively use silicon. And Genscript uses both CPG and silicon chips. But what is important are these circles. There's a lot of data here, but I just wanna say, uh, we have achieved uh, coupling efficiencies, which is the probability that you add the right base, uh, uh, given that you added N bases. And what is the probability of correctly adding the N plus one? And our customer is reporting greater than 99%. The industry standard these days is 99.5. In some cases, we have reached 99.7% and we are trying to reach 99.9%, .9%, which I believe has not been achieved. Um, I mentioned we have, we are the only substrate. Remember this is all solid state synthesis and we are the only one that has this high precision chemistry method to space out uh, the DNA uh, as they grow on the surface. Uh, 
Another aspect of our material is that the first step, the so-called chemical initiation, is, is very, very uh, sh short. Uh, we're talking about less than an hour uh, and using uh, non-toxic materials available in your local pharmacy. Whereas uh, to initiate silicon CD to activate it so that you can do DNA uh, growth, uh, requires overnight treatment with piranha solution. I mean, just the name, uh, I, I stay away from th something called piranha. Um, so these are the, uh, includes uh, hydrofluoric acid and nitric acid, sulfuric acid mixture. So it's, it's very corrosive. And at the end, uh, they don't achieve the same levels of um, uh, activation of the surface as we are able to achieve in less than an hour with, with less toxic materials. So. Now, um, we haven't tried going beyond 60 nucleotides, but I don't see a reason. Uh, we've done some estimates, estimates in terms of computational uh, simulations about the size of the oligo we can fit, and we can go to 120, perhaps 200. Just making the port larger uh, is, is the trick to allow enough room for reagents to, to, to go and diffuse through our material. Uh, one last comment is that, as I mentioned, for us, automation is to create as many oligos as possible. So silicon already uh, claim, uh, claim uh, that you can do a million oligos in one chip. However, they can only do it at femtomolar amounts, uh, 10 to the minus 13. Whereas we can go anywhere from nanomolar, which is enough to do preclinical trials to micromolar uh, which is enough to do uh, clinical trials. So we, we have the ability to print in regions of our chip to increase the yield. So there is a additional control. Um, thank you for that. All right, so let's see what else. Uh, our current focus is on early adapters, uh, companies, academics who want to try this out. Uh, uh, for applications in biological therapeutics. Uh, so DNA banking is basically done. We're happy with where we got with that. Uh, DNA probes may be in the future, but right now our focus is vaccines, DNA, RNA-based therapeutics. Now, we don't make them. What we are focused on is enabling our customers to do that in-house. So there's a lot of handholding, uh, a lot of resistance sometimes uh, to, to break the habit of sending your sequence, pressure sequence uh, to other countries uh, and risking uh, losing your intellectual property. So hopefully um, uh, by making it very simple, uh, easy to use uh, turnkey solutions, and they might be able to, to, to save themselves uh, those, those issues. But there are more important, I believe, uh, uh, other than intellectual property protection aspects to doing synthetic genes. And that is that we're able to create preclinical amounts of cell-free, animal-free DNA overnight. Uh, that means no bovine serum, uh, which is used for mammalian cells and or E. coli, uh, use of E. coli fermentation, which is the traditional means to do plasmid amplification. Uh, there's no need for plasmids. Um, uh, so therefore, there is no risk for cell DNA uh, and protein contaminants that can lead to undesired immunological reactions in preclinical trials. And we have already sufficient yields to run preclinical and clinical tests directly from synthesis, no fermentation or amplification needed. So we are at the center of those three circles in terms of good yields, cell-free and animal-free. Um, I should say though, let me go back here, that. There are constructs, as I mentioned earlier, that are not possible to do through fermentation because uh, E. coli has a mind of itself. It has its own uh, uh, code that says, oh, I refuse to make that sequence. It's, it's not good for me. So, so there are cases, I, I won't go into details, but one of our customers uh, is coming to us so we can do th those constructs for them. Um, so we're collaborating with pharma. Um, mm, developing DNA-based therapeutics. Uh, of course, once you have a DNA, you can make RNA uh, through reverse uh, uh, transcriptase. Um, and, and so, or we can actually make it directly using synthetic uh, uh, basis for nucleotides for RNA, no, no, no major change. So 
The supply chain and the timing is the number one issue for progress. Uh, it takes two months or longer to get a single gene in preclinical amounts, uh, sending out your, your sequence, uh, but it's also expensive. And the, so the standard lead times for external suppliers six to eight weeks uh, for a single gene. Uh, whereas we are producing sufficient yields for required gene libraries and animal tests uh, that can be created on our new format 10 by 10 centimeters uh, in, in a single day. Uh, I think I mentioned already this, uh, and so I'm gonna skip, um, but it's a little bit of the chemistry that goes on into creating the, the first, uh, uh, covalently bound species on our ceramic film. This is common to control pore glass. There is nothing proprietary here. Uh, what is proprietary is how do we achieve that uniform coverage and, and control the spaces between those molecules so that you can grow DNA well. So we have uh, six patents, some of uh, them granted and some of them applied for uh, worldwide. Uh, so all our inventions uh, 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 we have a strategy, we patent everything that can be reverse engineered, and believe me, there's a lot of that going on. And uh, uh, anything that cannot be reverse engineered, we just keep it as a trade secret. Uh, so that's our strategy. Good. Well, thank you so much. I'm going to turn this back uh, over to, to Zach and uh, maybe entertain some questions uh, now. And uh, Zach will do the rest. I don't know how we're doing in terms of time. Is that yeah perfect thanks mario uh excellent webinar super interesting um so yeah if anyone has additional questions um for for mario based on this please put it in the q a um so we do have one more question all right it says who are the typical customers like typical industries for dna chips and poor nanostructures oh who are they yeah well dna banking was there i mean dna banking uh they are early adapters um uh, any biological uh, uh, pharmaceutical company, biologic biologicals are anything from antibodies, proteins, peptides, uh, RNA, DNA that uh, uh, have therapeutic use, uh, uh, uses. Uh, those are our customers because even if they produce antibodies, they need to generate gene libraries, DNA libraries that that work with the uh, uh, with the area of the antibody that, that is responsible, the variable, the variable uh, region, which, which is responsible for the specificity of the antibody. Um, but also we are, we are hoping to catch on uh, some of the uh, uh, gene uh, uh, replacement therapies, uh, you know, CRISPR, Cas9 companies, uh, we're looking for early adapters. Um, the customers that we have uh, considered or, or are very easy to approach and, and, and immediately uh, come, come on board are early adapters, are companies that they have tried everything, they have tried the standard methods and they can't get what they need or they get it, but it takes a very long time and it's costly. So, so those are those early adapters are, are it's very sweet to work with them because they have a need and we have a, a solution. And uh, rather than wasting or sorry, <laughs> rather than spending money and time doing marketing, we prefer to to work uh, one at a time with customers and then keep them uh, as lifetime uh, customers. So we 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 are not here to 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 obtain you know five thousand customers in a year or something like that. No, our 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 growth uh, uh, strategy is to be uh, a tiny little BASF. Uh, we don't make the final product, we make the final product they make better. And that means uh, a lot of technical support and, and technology uh, development for them, very tight uh, research-based uh, uh, collaboration. And that means we are all also very open to working with, with, with academia. So uh, if, if anyone uh, is interested in a specific construct and you know, you, you would like to uh, co-write uh, either an uh, STTR or your own NIH uh, grant and, and mention us as a supplier, we'll be happy to, 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 to collaborate. I hope that answers your question. Awesome, thanks. 